I'm Dwayne Brown tonight on KPBS Evening Edition. A changing of the guard at City Hall today, San Diego, now has its first woman city council president. The first Latina mayor of Chula Vista is sworn in. I'm Peggy Pico with our conversation about her top priorities and vision for making Chula Vista a world-class city. But first, no more year-round schedules for 54 schools in the San Diego Unified School District. Why the shift and how it'll impact students and families. Also tonight, a research vessel back in San Diego this evening with a brighter outlook for some endangered marine mammals. And we'll meet the man working to unlock a treasure trove of information collected by the city. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. San Diego has its first woman city council president this evening. Sherry Leitner was voted in this afternoon on a contentious day at City Hall. KPBS Metro reporter Taryn Mento was there for the vote. She joins us from the News Center. Taryn, was it a unanimous vote? Dwayne, the special meeting today was very tense as rumors have been circulating that Leitner, a Democrat, would join with the four Republican council members to oust Council President Todd Gloria, who's also a Democrat. And we saw that play out today. After a vote to keep Gloria failed along party lines, Democratic Councilwoman Marty Emerald nominated Leitner and plays, praised Gloria for his work. Todd is still here, sharing his heart and his wonderful intellect, his passion, and he's not going away, and he's not going to stop being the leader he was born to be. What was uh, Gloria's reaction to the change today? Dozens of his supporters spoke before the vote and urged the council to keep him as president. That included labor groups, veterans, environmentalists, and a business organization leader. He said he was overwhelmed by the turnout, but said his priorities won't change after the vote, and he'll look forward to working with the new council president, Sherry Leitner. And speaking of Leitner, how did she accept her new role? She didn't speak before the vote, but Republican Councilman Scott Sherman praised her as bipartisan and said she was a person who could get things done. After Leitner won with seven votes, she and Gloria swapped chairs and name plaques, and she adjourned the meeting. She was tearing up as she left the, the chambers. Of course, the vote had been delayed, uh, so new council member Chris Kate could take part. He was actually sworn in today, right? Right, but there was a protest at the inauguration. Um, some protesters were at the ceremony at Golden Hall with signs saying, I can't breathe, referring to the police-involved death of a black man in Staten Island. The protest was a peaceful one. KPBS Metro reporter, Taryn Mento. Year-round school schedules are being phased out next fall in San Diego Unified. Peggy Pico talks with a school board member about the changes. San Diego Unified School Board voted unanimously last night to phase out all of its 54 year round school schedules and return them to a traditional academic calendar. Joining me with the details of the $12 million four year project is my guest, San Diego Unified School District Board Vice President John Lee Evans. And welcome to Evening Edition. Thank you very much. Now, John, uh, why does the district want to shift to these year round schools back to the traditional schedule that includes summers off? Well, there are a few reasons, and one of the reasons is basically that it is disruptive to families because you might have a child in elementary school who's on a year-round schedule, but then when they're in high school, the older siblings are in, on a, uh, a traditional schedule, and so the vacations and times don't match up. Another thing is the, the military families, they're, they're used to deploying and moving in the summertime, and as a result, some of them leave before the end of the year-round school year is over, and they, they miss out on a lot of academics. No, I understand this mostly affects <coughs> elementary schools, uh, a handful of K-8 and mm -hmm. middle schools. How will this change be phased in? Well, what we're really doing, we decided that there's just too much money to do in one year, so we're doing about 25% of the schools each year, 
And basically what we started with was the high, uh, high military schools, a lot of them because of the fact that they're most impacted by this. All right, and we do have that list of those schools that are going to be starting right. in 2015, right? Right, right. 15 there'll, be about, schools. there'll be 15 schools in 2015. All right, we have that on our website that right. folks can look for those uh, schools specifically. Now, research has shown that long uh, summer breaks can actually hurt low-income and uh, English language learners academically uh, more profusely than they would maybe other students. How will San Diego Unified help the kids that actually benefit from this year-round uh, calendar? Well, actually, I think they will, they will benefit from the traditional calendar because what we really need to do is amplify our summer programs. So if we have more summer school programs, uh, I, I think eventually if we had the money, we would extend the school year further into the summer uh, and even extending the, the school day. There are lots of ways, that we, things that we can do to achieve this. This is really an operational thing that we're just out of sync with each other. The board estimates <laughs> this is going to cost a little more than $12 million over, over the four years, mm -hmm. I understand. What's the money going to be spent on and where's the money coming from? Well, the reason that it costs, this one-time cost is because our fiscal year begins July 1st and our year-round teachers are teaching through the month of July. So well, they will finish out the month of July and then they'll do a full academic year after that. So there's, it's basically one extra month of pay for a lot of teachers and staff. Well, the board yeah. estimates, the, um, I, we mm -hmm. talked about that cost, but it's $3 million, uh, just for this coming school year. For the first year, right? Year, okay. right. Now, we reached out to the teachers union, and they sent a statement uh, that says, in part, mm -hmm. that the uh, San Diego Education Association believes that any changes made need to involve input from all stakeholder groups that could be impacted by a calendar change, such as the parents, teachers, and administrators at the school. Did the board consult with uh, these groups, these stakeholders, teachers, parents, and the association? Right. There, there's been an outreach to the schools, particularly the first ones that are that are being affected. Uh, last year, we already had pre-approved about four of these schools, and we had an extensive outreach effort, both the parents. Uh, we consulted and conferred with the various unions at the same time. And, and what are you hearing? Are teachers supportive of this? Are you getting pushback from parents? From the, using the example of the first four that we already did, uh, there was very strong support for doing this. Okay, and if you could just walk us through this transition come uh, mm -hmm. fall 2015, what's that going to look like for folks? They'll be notified. How's that going to work? Well, they'll, they will know well ahead of time, just as we voted last night, so that they will know that this is going to happen. And basically what they will do is they will finish up their uh, school year in July, uh, the ones that have been on year round that are changing, and then they will join with everybody else starting up again in September, which will be a shorter summer break, but that's what they're used to anyway. Okay, and I know, um, so this is the subject that we're talking about as far as the uh, school year and shifting that, but also the board voted last night on uh, the school year when it's supposed to start. Mm -hmm. There was some discussion that it, they might want to start it uh, a little bit uh, earlier than uh, what it is right now. Uh, mm -hmm. What happened there? Why did the board reject that? Well, it kind of goes back to your previous question about getting input from all the stakeholders, and we actually didn't ha uh, spend as much time on that as we should have in terms of going uh, starting a week earlier. So what we decided to do was to keep it the status quo starting the day after Labor Day for next year, but start right away in the next couple of months talking about changing for the, for the following year, but really giving the parents and teachers and everybody the full information about why it's a good idea. All right, John Lee Evans, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. A one-of-a-kind preschool program in the South Bay is helping children who've been exposed to family violence is often a generational problem. And this program focuses on breaking the cycle from cradle to the classroom. Because of safety concerns, you won't find the name of this therapeutic preschool program anywhere outside where the children play. Organizers say all of these kids have either experienced or been exposed to some sort of domestic violence. When you have a three-year-old, a four-year-old, a five-year-old witnessing day in and day out domestic violence between their parents and their family members, it causes problems with attachment, insecurity, and thinking that the world is an unsafe place. Mi Escolita, or My Little School, opened in 2006 with 40 kids. It now serves nearly twice as many with a full-time therapist. Feel free to pick an activity, but make sure you clean up after yourselves. Chula Vista has one of the highest recorded rates of domestic violence in the county. This is something that we can stop, and we are excited that Mi Escolita we're not fixing later, we're, we're intervening now. So we are breaking the cycle of violence and we hope that we become a model and we can help other schools and other communities in, in the nation look at this model to help more children. It appears to be working. A five-year study by UC San Diego shows 
The early learning programs help produce better reading and math scores when the children move on to elementary school. Each grade level, K through fifth grade, our kids, again, are doing just as well as their peers and sometimes better, especially in math. Making it far less likely they'll ever be placed in special education classes. Mi Escolida is a partnership between the Chula Vista Elementary School District and South Bay Community Services. High school students marched on the offices of the Metropolitan Transit System today. They want the transit agency to invest in a bus pass program. It's already given free passes to students at four schools. Supporters say they can help low-income students get to school on time and take on internships. I strongly support the Youth Bus Pass campaign because I think it is, it is very crucial for us to offer each and every one and every young student the equal opportunity to pursue their education, future and career. An MTS spokesman says the agency is waiting to see the results of the pilot program before making any decisions. San Diego Unified uh, paid 200000 bucks for the program this school year. Annual uh, passes for students cost about 400 bucks a year. Uber is, Uber is being sued by prosecutors in Los Angeles and San Francisco. The suit says the ride-sharing company makes false claims about background checks on its drivers. Uber is facing lawsuits in other states. A judge already barred the company from operating in Nevada. Work is nearly done on a toll road linking Tijuana and Ensenada. You may recall last year it was shut down because of a landslide. The 20-mile stretch of highway is expected to reopen next week. Another optimistic forecast for California's economy. Economists at UCLA say the state unemployment rate will fall nearly two full percentage points by the end of 2016. They also expect personal income growth to jump to over 4 percent over the next couple of years. A ballot recount underway for a Chula Vista City Council race between candidates John McCann and Steve Padilla. The certified results show McCann is the winner by two votes. The recount isn't done yet. McCann was also sworn in Tuesday during a special council meeting. Chula Vista has a new mayor and she joins Peggy Pico for a conversation about what lies ahead for the county's second largest city? Former Chula Vista City Councilwoman Mary Salas is now the 40th mayor of Chula Vista and first Latina mayor of the city. A former state assemblywoman, she defeated her opponent, Jerry Rendon, and succeeds Mayor Cheryl Cox, who termed out after eight years. Chula Vista Mayor Mary Salas, welcome to Evening Edition. Thank you so much. Now, I understand you are a fifth generation Chula Vistan, and your grandparents moved to the city in 1919. Yes, Is that I correct? Did. That's correct. <laughs> Remind us of uh, how you, your political involvement and your connection to the city. My political involvement, well, first of all, um, I think that my uncles uh, were great mentors to me because they were all civically involved. And um, I had my uncle A.Y. Casillas was the first Latino that was ever elected to the Chula Vista Elementary School Board in the 60s. And then uh, my uncle Joe David Casillas ha has always served on boards and commissions. And, the city and you and served county. as well on the city council for eight years, yes, correct? Yes, I did. Okay, okay. Uh -huh. And uh, you actually ran for Senate in 2010? Yes, and I lost that by um, 22 votes out of almost 100,000 ballots that were cast. So it was a very, very, a very close, very close call. race. But yeah. I'm actually happy that I lost because I've always wanted to be mayor of Chula Vista. Well, congratulations on that. Now, you were sworn in as mayor last night, um, but Chula Vista does not have a strong mayor form of government, meaning your vote is mm -hmm. just one of five votes uh, on the council. Uh, how is being mayor then beneficial? Well, you know, the, the mayor is the face of the, of the council and the face of the city. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, the mayor is actually the person that people go to, for example, interviews. Um, we're the one that sets the agenda. And, um, you know, leadership styles are different, and I expect that I'll be a lot more involved in the community in my administration. Speaking of which, what are your uh, top three pri 
priorities uh, as mayor? Well, the first thing is job creation, and we're going to accomplish that through finally having uh, ha something happen on the Bayfront. Uh, we're making great great strides for our four-year university, and then we've got the exciting Millennium Project in the Eastern Urban Center. So uh, we have a lot of opportunity um, in the next several years for, for creating you know, thousands of construction jobs, but after those job centers are developed, then that will have steady employment for our community. You now, your predecessor dealt with pension reform and, and, and budget restrictions and budget cuts. Mm -hmm. What do you see as the most urgent issue uh, facing the, the city right now? Well, certainly we have a terrible deficit in our infrastructure projects. So we have roads that need repair, we need sidewalks that need repairing, um, we need to tackle the problem of uh, wastewater, all those things that aren't sexy things but that um, make the quality of, of life in the city import, very good for people, uh, you know, make it a better experience. And also when you have those things set in place, um, businesses want to come to your city, people want to live there. And so it's an important component of economic development and job creation to have your infrastructure in good shape. Okay. So infrastructure, and it goes back to your top three priorities, you're kind of linking that to your mm -hmm. jobs. Um, when and how will your vacant seat uh, on the city council actually be filled? Well, the people of Chula Vista voted overwhelmingly to so support Proposition B, which will, will allow the city council to make an appointment to that seat. And it's very important that we get the job done qui quickly because of all the important initiatives that we have before us. So um, we will be... Uh, asking people to submit applications to fill that vacancy. Uh, we'll, I think it's going to be like a December 15th okay. uh, when we're going to issue the, the And it'll be an appointment, so no special hopefully, election. Yes, okay. Hopefully, yes, um, hopefully. You're San Diego uh, County's first Latina mayor. Uh, what do you think is needed to get more Latinos in uh, public offices? Well, it's something that I've been working on for many years. I was first recruited to run by the women of MANA of San Diego County. I joined, joined that orga organization in 1988. And so having those, um, those positive places uh, and organizations so that Latinas can join or Latinos and they can develop their leadership skills. And I fully um, give credit to MANA of San Diego County for, for getting me interested in politics. All right, Chula Vista Mayor Mary Salas, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brightly colored packaging and illegal growing operations, two reasons the county's narcotics task force says marijuana is dangerous for children. Today they outline four ways they say San Diego children are being put at risk. KPBS reporter Matt Bowler joins us from the News Center with the story. The task force says that butane hash oil, edibles, collectives, and marijuana grow operations are all ways pot can endanger children. These labs are very dangerous. They're very hazardous to any of the occupants, but especially to children. Task force members say they've busted 54 butane labs, 16 of which had children at them. But Michael Sindridge, executive director of the San Diego chapter of Normal, doesn't buy the numbers. I believe those numbers are misrepresented. Uh, when the DA's office or the DEA's office, when they mention a BHO lab, it's not necessarily a laboratory, as you would think when you see uh, as far as a science lab or something you would see in Breaking Bad. Assistant District Attorney Stacy Reynolds says that doesn't matter, and she's going to prosecute even if no hash oil has been made. We'll charge things that may not be an operational lab. The DA and the DEA think that butane hash oil production is like meth production. But folks, marijuana and butane honey oil is our new methamphetamine lab. Sindridge disagrees. And I, I think it's ridiculous for anyone to say that meth and pot uh, are similar or the same. Sindridge says BHO production is dangerous and illegal in California, but it can be done safely. He looks to Colorado. In Colorado, they have regulations for making BHO. And because of that, we're not seeing the same problems. Task force members say edibles are another hazard for children. Look at how they're packaged. They're certainly not geared towards us adults. We don't look at that and say, wow, how cool does that packaging look? I'm going to buy it because of that. We buy it because we want it. Kids want to buy it because it looks cool. 
Normal calls this assertion absurd. I think it's absurd. Um, I've met with hundreds of dispensary owners, operators, and employees, and I have never met one that is actively marketing or that would sell to a minor. Uh, it, it's just absurd that someone would say that. And lastly, DEA task force members say that marijuana collectives attract violence. We know, we've known all along what happens with drug dealers. It doesn't change because we want to call it a dispensary. It doesn't change because we want to call it an edible. It doesn't change because we want to call it medicine. Sindrich says if dispensaries felt they could reach out to the police for help, there would be less violence. Matt Bowler, KPBS News. City of Boston lets citizens track its spending online. In Oakland, public records requests are posted on its website. Open government tools like this may be coming to San Diego. Our Metro reporter Taryn Mento introduces us to the person in charge of turning data into something you can easily find. If you take out your smartphone or laptop and open Google Maps, you can figure out how to get anywhere in San Diego without a car. Just type in your location and your destination, then click on the address, select the bus icon, and Google shows you the 215 to the orange line will get you from the KPBS studio to San Diego City Hall. Open data makes this possible. Google pulls information from a file the city shares online. It contains rows of stop times, dates, and route numbers organized by titled columns. That's the data. And because it's public, it's open data. The city tracks a lot more than just public transportation routes, but much of the data in the city's possession could be hidden in a filing cabinet or buried within the city's tricky to navigate website. Web developer Ben Katz said unearthing this information is crucial. The city is sitting on a huge amount of data about uh, our streets, about our um, police, our fire, um, about our libraries, everything that the city does, there's data about. And that data can help Im improve decision making. It can help us find out what's happening well, what's happening badly. It can help us do things better. Uncovering these records is where San Diego's newest hire comes in. My full name is Maxim Petersky. It's really fun to spell. He's San Diego's chief data officer, a 27-year-old Russian-born, Chicago-raised web developer who intends to single-handedly crack open the city's data. Katz actually helped hire him. What I'm hoping to do is um, allow citizens to engage with the city um, by, you know, like one of the things is like building apps or and also increasing internal efficiencies in government. Which is what he spent most of this year doing in Puerto Rico. Pachersky helped to design Premier Peso, a website that easily connects current or aspiring business owners with government grant programs. And we can actually aggregate that into a central place and show it to the Department of Economic Development and say, hey, look, Here's all these people in this region that are asking for this information, and you guys are not providing anything in this region. And after only nine days on the job in San Diego, he's already jazzed about launching similar projects here. I want to go through and see, like, how, you know, how do I open a business in San Diego? Like, what is it that I need, right? And then kind of go through that whole process and see where, where can we find the holes and maybe just at least initially quick wins and then afterwards, you know, kind of build on that. Some city departments have already put data online. OpenDSD lets you find building permits or code enforcement cases in your neighborhood. Head of the Community Planners Committee, Joe LaCava, says the site is helpful with routine phone calls he gets from citizens concerned about construction in their neighborhoods. With OpenDSD available to me, while we were on the phone, I could actually open it up, zero in, and give them all the information. And in that case, the fact that there was a valid permit they were perfectly satisfied. That's all they wanted to know, that it was properly permitted and being watched at by the city of San Diego. LaCava says it also benefits the city. It could reduce the demand on staff to take phone calls uh, from a citizen who wants to know where something is going on, why is it going on, where's the permit for that, um, and it could allow the city to do more with the, with the staff they have. New data chief Petersky says it's these kinds of problems he wants to solve. I think the most valuable things is like I want to know what kind of bothers people right now and from those is kind of just have a little notebook going with some ideas. And so if you want to let Petersky know what bugs you, send him an email or tweet him at Mr. Maximize. Or if you want to know what he's up to, just check out his GitHub page where he publishes his code for public use. Even for city projects, much to his boss's surprise. Is it already? Did you already post it? Yeah. Oh, it's already public? The timeline? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I told you I did. <laughs> it's okay. It's right. Open data for the win. <laughs> Taryn Mento, KPBS News. Video journalist Nick McVicker helped produce that story. You can find more about the city's open data efforts on our website, kpbs.org.
A research ship sailed into San Diego today, wrapping up a survey of marine mammals living along the West Coast. KPBS reporter Eric Anderson tells us they found encouraging signs for some endangered species. The 120-day journey began off the Washington State coast and methodically moved south. Chief scientist Jay Barlow says his team scoured the open ocean, counting whales, dolphins, and porpoises. They used both their eyes and their ears. Some animals are submerged, and we'd completely miss them if we were only looking at the, at the animals that are above the surface. They, the, the beaked whales can dive for 40 minutes, a sperm whale can dive for over an hour, and we'd miss these if we didn't also listen for the animals. Scientist Karen Forney says a sophisticated acoustic array on a 300-meter-long cable helped find animals hiding under the surface. See that little H thing on the, on the back? They would spool it off the ship through there and it would get just let out behind the ship and we would be trailing that array. The researchers can already make some preliminary conclusions. They saw enough humpback and fin whales to make a case for removing them from the endangered species list. And Forney says observers saw species in San Diego ocean waters that they normally don't see. This year, as you may have heard, is a warmer year in the California current, and we did see evidence of that in some of the species seen during the cruise, and the loggerhead turtles also. Um, we had not ever seen them in, the, in those numbers in the California current before. Researchers hope to have some of the data that they gathered on this trip ready by summer, but it'll be years before they process everything. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. Of course, you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.